Welcome everyone to our Wednesday webinar. This is our last in a four part series detailing what took place during the 2021 legislative session. I'm Cameron Deal, the executive director of the Utah League of Cities and Towns. And I am joined today by representatives of the Utah Chiefs of Police Association, uh, Chief Brian William of the Long Peak Police Department, as well as David Ashley Spadafore, uh, who represent the uh, Chiefs of Police on Capitol Hill, as well as uh, John Park and Carson Eilers from League staff. Uh, before we jump into the details, Chief, I want to give you a moment to say hello and, and give, give some thoughts on behalf of the Chiefs of Police Association. So take it away, Chief. Great, thank you, Cameron. And it's it's great to be with you this afternoon. Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. While we discuss police legislation today, and what occurred this this past legislative session. Just by way of introduction, my name is Brian William. I'm the chief of police with Lone Peak Public Safety, which is Highland and Alpine. We we provide services to both of those cities, police service to both of those cities. I'm also a member of the executive Com committee of the Utah Chiefs of Police Association, and I serve as what they call a SACOP representative. So I represent the state of Utah and the chiefs of police on a national level with the International Association of the Chiefs of Police. And it, it is my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, my participation this last year in the legislative session, I was a, a bit of a rookie. I don't say a bit of a rookie, I was a rookie and I, I appreciate the patience of, of Cameron and the Spatafors of putting up with a lot of my questions and educating me on how the legislative session works. I don't pretend to know uh, nearly as, as much as they do, but I, I got kind of got my feet wet and, and drug into it this year. With everything that we've seen happen over the last nine months, I felt a responsibility personally that I needed to get involved and try and make a difference. Uh, one of those was by, by being asked by a then police chief and now the, um, the head of the Co Juvenile Commission on Juvenile Justice, uh, Tom Ross of Bountiful, asked me to participate in the Love, Listen, Lead, which was, I think it was the brainchild of Cameron and a few others who thought uh, it might be a good idea for law enforcement and legislatures and the league to get out in front of some of the legislation and bring in good ideas so we can, we can uh, draft good legislation and make good policy on what police reform, and I'll put that in air quotes, what that looks like in Utah. And what are the things that we need to do uh, from a law enforcement perspective and from leaders in our community's perspective to uh, lead out and be responsible and be active participants in the change that, that we saw over this last legislative session and what we'll see in the future. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked to sit on that Love, Listen, Lead task force and um, learned a lot um, from, from Cameron and, and the league staff and other chiefs and the spat of wars. And I just appreciate that opportunity. I think we're gonna to continue to be doing some of that as we move forward during the, uh, the interim and, and as we move forward. But I just appreciate all of the hard work that, that Cameron and his staff has, have done and that David and Ashley Spadafore have done for law enforcement and for uh, leaders throughout our communities, for mayors and, and council members. And I, I just believe we have uh, a good footing under us, we have this foundation that we've built over the last nine months, and I think we just need to build on that and move forward in a positive direction as we, as we look forward to change and providing good services to our to our residents. And with that, um, I'll turn that time back over to you. Thank you, Cameron. Terrific, thank you, Chief, uh, both for joining us today, as well as for your service, not just to Northern Utah County, but for your service on that Love, Listen, Lead Task Force. When we think about where things were in the public safety space 10 months ago, uh, I think we can all take a deep breath and say we in Utah found a way to find the space uh, for good policy that both supports officers uh, and identified areas of improvement to ensure community trust in police. And I think our task force was a, was a critical component in that overall dialogue. So Chief, thanks to you and to the other representatives from the Utah Chiefs of Police Association. Over the next hour, our intent is to give you a forum to ask questions about bills that passed. Uh, we will quickly walk through the highlighted bills. Uh, we will then provide a copy, not just of this PowerPoint, but also of our legislative wrap, recap uh, that's coming in the next few days. It'll have everything, public safety, elections, administration, 
land use, everything, all in that recap. Uh, today, we'll hit the highlights in the public safety space. Uh, we will also give you a sense of what we anticipate is coming on the horizon this interim and for the 22 legislative session and beyond. If you have questions, that's why uh, that's why the, the good folks at Zoom created a chat box. So please put your chat or put your questions in the chat room or on the Q and A. And between the panelists, we will monitor that and answer your questions. So you do not need to save your questions to the end. As we're talking about bills, if you have questions about a specific bill, bring it up. If we can't answer it, then we'll circle back and, and get that answer for you. So with that, let's get underway. Carson, can you start sharing and and bring up the PowerPoint? Chief William mentioned, you can go into the next slide, mentioned the Love, Listen, Lead Task Force. And this, this started in a conversation between former Bountiful Police Chief Tom Ross, his city manager, Gary Hill, and me uh, shortly after uh, the tragic death of George Floyd in Minneapolis last summer. As we were watching protests take place around the country and we were watching legislatures start to consider bills that would impact public safety, uh, we recognized that it was vital for local government to have a space where we could have some candid conversations, but also listen to community members, get their feedback, and, and understand the problems that we were trying to address. As a result, the League Board and the UCOPA Board uh, put together a cross-section of membership, including elected officials, police chiefs, attorneys, and managers, literally running, running from North Logan to St. George. That's not hyperbole, that those are legitimately, that's the geographic reach of this task force. Um, you can go to the next slide. You'll notice I highlighted West Storm Police Chief Ken Wallentine in red. That's because as of last month, Chief Wallentine is now the new president of the Chiefs of Police Association and has agreed to take over Chief Ross's spot as co-chair of the Loveless and League Committee. Uh, likewise, Mike Mendenhall, who's a Spanish Fork Council member and immediate past president of the League of Cities and Towns, will also continue as co-chair. Over the course of the last few months, our task force met with a variety of entities and individuals in an effort to demonstrate that we were listening to community members and trying to understand uh, the problems that they saw to again, find that space where we could support officers but identify potential areas of improvement. We also conducted and a comprehensive survey on community trust in police with Y2 Analytics. We, and I say we, John Park and I will be explaining some of those survey results at our mid-year conference next week. Uh, we've shared those results with our task force and with the League Board of Directors, and we'll be sharing it more publicly in the weeks to come. I also want to thank during the session Representative Ryan Wilcox and Senator Todd Weiler, who are the two legislative committee chairs who facilitated some really important dialogue. At one point, there were over 80 public safety bill files open. We ultimately ended up with more than 20 bills that were considered by the Love, Listen, Lead Task Force, and ultimately we supported. And in addition to the bills beyond the task force, uh, the chiefs in the league supported over 90% of the bills that passed that impact public safety in some way. Um, and those bills that we didn't support that, that passed are going to continue to be considered this interim. Carson, you can go ahead to the, to the next slide. We identified last fall that there were really three primary buckets of bills, of data, training and qualifications of officers, and the officer misconduct process that we could address in the 2021 session. So today's presentation is going to touch on those, the bills in those three categories, data, training qualifications, and the officer misconduct process. And then we have a handful of other bills that were outside of Love, Lesson, Lead, but are also relevant. Then we'll talk about what bills we're already anticipating and what dialogue is already underway for the 2022 legislative session. So I'll start by hitting the data bills, and then I'll turn it over to the SPATA force to talk about training qualifi qualification bills. So the three primary data bills are House Bill 84, House Bill 264, and Senate Bill 159. House Bill 84 is Representative Romero's use of force reporting requirements. What this bill does is it requires the Bureau of Commun Criminal Identification to include statistics on use of force by law enforcement agencies uh, that local law enforcement agencies submit. 
So this is essentially enhancing an existing data reporting requirement. And your local agency uh, needs to work with the Bureau to, de to determine the compliance on, on that reporting. One thing that we learned as a task force and the legislators learned as well is that there were a lot of policy questions we couldn't answer because data didn't really exist in an apples to apples, oranges to oranges sort of way. There's a lot of data out there, but there was some inconsistency in how that data was collected and what state law required of local governments. At one point, there was a double digit number of of bills out there in the data collection space. We sat down, John Park and I and Staff Force sat down with the governor's staff about halfway through the session, right, John? And just laid out all of the different data collection bills and really tried to funnel them down to the ones that were easily accomplishable right now, and then talked about the foundation of data collection going forward. Um, the second bill that, that again builds on what what happens currently is House Bill 264, Law Enforcement Weapons Use Amendment. Uh, this bill requires that a law enforcement officer file a report after pointing a firearm or a taser at an individual. Most agencies already have this as an agency policy, but this bill will now bring some consistency um, across the state in how those reports are collected and how that data is collected. Those were the two primary bills that are new data collection enhancements. The big data collection bill that you need to know about is SB 159, and it's less about what it means today and more about what it means going forward. Senator Jake Andrick was the Senate point person on public safety bills during the session, and he, in every Big Ten meeting we had with Commissioner Anderson, was constantly asking about data collection, what we could do, what we couldn't do, what we were collecting, et cetera. As a result, uh, his bill, SB 59, mandates that the Utah Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice assemble a panel of professionals and experts to make recommendations regarding the collection and management of public safety data in the state and coordinate that with local governments. The time for the initial report of SB 159 is this coming November uh, at that interim meeting. I met a couple of weeks ago with the new head of the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, who, as Chief William mentioned, is the former Bountiful Police Chief, Tom Ross. And we started the conversation of what compliance with this bill looks like and how to best incorporate local government in this framework. If your city is interested in participating in these conversations, let us know as soon as possible. You can send us an email, you can drop it in the chat room, but as we are figuring out everything from the technical side of this data collection to the policy questions ranging around what to collect and who should access it and how it fits under grandma and everything else. Uh, we welcome the input and participation of our members. So that's in a, in a nutshell what happened on the data side. HB 84 and 264 are new requirements. SB 159 is really laying the foundation for a bigger conversation about data in the months ahead. Carson, you can pass it on to the next slide, and I'll turn the time over uh, to this battle force to talk about the training and qualifications bills. Uh, thanks again, Cam, for letting us join. Uh, I'll start off here with the training and qualifications bill, and I'm going to talk about three, the first three bills and kind of um, how they all work together. It's going to be HB 162, Representative Romero's Peace Officer Training, HB 301, Periuchi's Domestic Violence Training Amendments, and then Elison's 334. So the, the thing about that, these all deal with the annual 40 hours of training and uh, that, that a police officer has to undergo. And, and so if, if, you, if your officers get training from post, you know, nothing really to, to do, but, but be aware of. And then if you, if you have your own departments with, with your own training, you know, these are the modifications that you will have to make. So the, the first one is um, HB 162, Angela Romero. Out of the, in this, base, this bill basically says, out of the 40 hours of annual training, 16 hours have to be include, have to include uh, uh, mental health and other CIT or crisis intervention responses, arrest control and de-escalation training. So it's not an additional um, to the 40 hours, but part of the 16 hours, part of the 40 hours have to include these um, techniques. And then every year there's gonna have to be an annual report clearly identifying which, uh, you know, how, how those um, uh, requirements were met. Um, th the next one, 
301, HB 301, this is domestic violence training amendments. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't require additional hours. Again, it's of the 40 hours and it doesn't say how much you have to do or, or what you have to include. Uh, what does have to have to do? So you have to now include um, uh, violence, uh, domestic violence and lethal, lethality assessment training um, every single year. And then again, it's gonna be coordination with department, um, uh, the Division of Child and Family Services and the department or the DPS. The third bill, kind of in this additional or expanded training uh, to be included is HB 334, the special needs training. Uh, so again, it doesn't say how many additional hours, but you have to include within the 40 hours training that specifically relates to um, any to aut autism, any aut autism spectrum disorder illnesses, uh, any other mental illnesses. Um, and so this will have to be go into that 40 hours. House Bill 345, uh, the School Resource Officers Amendments, uh, was a bill that, uh, that we worked on with Chiefs with Representative Sandra Hollins. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Chief Darren Adams from Cedar City and Chief Alan Swanson from Layton as being the, the two primary focal points on this bill. Uh, as you all know, uh, currently, if you have schools in your jurisdiction, uh, you, the agreement that is signed between your community, your city or town, and your local education uh, uh, agency uh, requires training for your police officers uh, if they are if they are uh, school resource officers. This bill tweaks that just a little to include information on developing and supporting successful relationships with students as well as the legal parameters of searching students on school property. This was a watered down version of the bill that we worked on with Representative Hollins. Uh, we wanted it to go a little bit further, you know, to, to, to try and uh, include reports provided by the school in term, in, uh, as to uh, the interactions uh, between and among the student or our school resource officers and school administration. Uh, the Senate did not uh, want to go that far this year, so we may see this bill surface uh, with, with uh, the part of the bill that was taken out on the Senate floor. Cam, to you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I think it's important to um, understand how we came to consensus on these training bills. Um, so as both metaphors, you, you mentioned how these are not additional hours that are required of police officers as part of their annual certification. But that's actually where we started uh, eight, nine months ago, was saying that there was some in the legislature who said, let's expand the 40 hour annual certification requirement. And then on top of those 40 hours require these new classes. Ultimately, as part of the dialogue, these, these new requirements were all built into the current 40 hour requirement. The second thing I think it's important to, to note on these training bills is that we heard from our own officers as part of the listen and love, listen, lead, um, that our officers were supportive of enhanced training options. And we also heard from the general public in our survey work that they wanted to see some additional specialized training uh, and so, again, this, this was very much in that space that, that we could call a win-win-win. Uh, John, any, any thoughts on, on your end or any comments you want to add here before we move on to the, the canine bill? Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to add something uh, about the three bills that, that Ashley uh, commented on. And Ashley, let me know if, I, if I'm wrong here, but, but uh, HB 162 requires 16 hours as part uh, part of that 40 hours, but in reality, reality, the training required in 301 and the training required in 334 also fits within that 16 hours. And so it's it's not that you have to provide the 16 hours as part of that 40 plus the 301 and plus the 334. Uh, I have that right, don't I, Ashley? Yeah, and it, it can, and the, the nice thing is, and this was part of again, like Cam discussed, a lot of the negotiations we had. It's not. It, it's not prescriptive. It's not actually laid out what you have to include. I mean, it just says you have to include it in some way. And so sometimes these trainings overlap. Some of that, um, you know, in 162 could be inclusive of, of some of the domestic violence training. So, I mean, I think there's there's overlap 
and there's um, uh, coordination and, and a lot of over, there's a lot of coordination and overlap with, with, with the three bills and with, with a lot of the training that already exists. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's better just highlighting, sometimes it's highlighting a lot of things that we already do and expanding it and then making sure that the community is aware of the training that's under, undergone. So I think, you, you, yeah, you're definitely correct, John. Oh, I, I, not to be contrary, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure that the hours on domestic violence and special needs is included under 162. Uh, I think we need to double check that. I, you know, it's all, all of the three bills are included in the annual 40 hours, but I'm not sure when 301 and 334 are included in 162 because they all passed individually. No, and my, my when I said that incorrectly, is what I meant was included that are already included within the 40 hours or that is already that officers or, or the training programs or post is already doing so it, it's not necessarily new some of these training already exist that that's not not 162 and, and the other two I, so thank you for the clarification Dave perfect yeah thank, thanks to all of you and the other two bills aren't aren't necessarily trained per se, but they fit into this overall uh, conversation on qualification. One is SB 38. Uh, this applies to your agency if you have a canine unit. Uh, the really the key takeaway here is that your handlers and your canines uh, must be certified by their post or by a national organization. Uh, so it's the Law Enforcement Canine Team Certification Act. So if you have a canine. Take a look, or K9 unit, take a look at SB 38. And this was another example where most agencies were already certified. Uh, and this was bringing that additional consistency around, around the certification. SB 102. And may I just interject one statement, one thing on, on, on yep, 38? Uh, that bill was essentially drafted by uh, Ken Wallentine, the West Jordan uh, chief, uh, and, and now our new chief's president, with former representative Lee Perry. And, and uh, the, the, the certification can come from post or any national organization. Just, you know, so it's nothing that's, it's nothing that's gonna, that, that should cause anyone a problem. And there are plenty of, op plenty of options for the certification. Yep, perfect, thank you, Dave. And I'm glad you brought up Lee Perry because even though Lee Perry retired from the legislature, uh, he, was very active through the session behind the scenes, uh, helping on bills. Lee recently also retired from the Utah Highway Patrol and was the go-to voice for law enforcement uh, within the House caucus. And his, we were concerned about what his retirement would mean within the legislature. Uh, the good news is that his replacement uh, is also a law enforcement officer, but is an even better one because he works for a city. Uh, he's employed at Roy City and as Representative Gwynn, uh, and he is already starting to take the mantle of being the voice of law enforcement within the House of Representatives. Uh, SB 102 is a bill that had come in years past, uh, but I think the, the moment was right this year. I mentioned a few times that we did our public survey where we were asking the general public uh, where they saw potential areas of improvement and we were asking people of all ages and all races for their input in that scientific survey and one piece of one piece of the data that was in, insightful was a desire to see more diversity within the police ranks this bill hopefully will help address that uh, because this bill now authorizes an individual to become a police officer or dispatcher if that individual is a lawful resident of the united states uh, has legal authorization to work in the United States. So in other words, uh, someone who has been, uh, someone who is legally in the United States, but may not have become a citizen yet, uh, similar to how that individual can serve in the military, those individuals will now be able to serve as peace officers. So we think this could be a nice step toward addressing uh, those diversity issues that we saw in the public survey. Carson, you can go to the to the next slide. Scott Forge, I'll turn it back over to you to talk about. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. No, I was just going to add to that. Um, I, I can't remember what the final count was, but I think there were there's 12 other states that already allow that. So, you know, we're not the first to do it. It's we're we're joining a list of states that already allow for that. Perfect. Thank you. I'll I'll let you guys continue with House Bill 59, which. Uh, 
Interestingly, the issue with, uh, that led to House Bill 59 was, uh, it was back in the newspaper today. So I'll let the two of you talk through that bill. House Bill 59 uh, from Representative Andrew Stoddard is a direct result of uh, uh, the unfortunate situation we had on the University of Utah campus uh, with uh, Lauren McCluskey and uh, the uh, 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 and the situation that occurred when the officer involved uh, in that uh, in that situation shared uh, intimate images of uh, of Ms. McCluskey uh, to other officers. What House Bill Fifty Nine does is that it will provide for criminal penalties for any individual, law enforcement and attorneys uh, who, who uh, duplicate, share, copy, or display an intimate image during a criminal action if it's not for the, the investigation itself. So as a city, you know, we just need to make sure that in your agencies and in your prosecutors, uh, if, if that is the case with your prosecutors, that uh, only those involved in the investigation uh, uh, have access to the, uh, to the evidence in, this, in the case. Cam, you were doing the other three. Yep, I am, thank you. When I look back, oh, we've got our first, well, we've got a couple of questions, but this is our first uh, uh, question about a bill specifically from Camille Williams uh, to us asking, uh, can prosecutors not show the photos as evidence? Are either of you willing to take a, take a stab at that question? Uh, if it's evidence that the photos can be seen in, in during, the, during the criminal proceeding, yes. This does not impact that. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Camille, well, they, it, really doesn't, it really doesn't impact the ability to use those those uh, images as part of an ongoing criminal investigation, but anything outside of that and people that don't need to know is who it affects. Is that correct? That, John, uh, John, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Perfect, thank you both. Uh, SB 13 and SB 196 are companion bills and House Bill 62 is related. So I'm actually gonna start my comments on SB 13. When I look back at Loveless and Lead, I probably spent more time on SB 13 than any other bill. Um, yeah, John, you're chuckling. This is one that where it started and where it ended up, we're in two different places, but we ended up in a very good spot uh, where everyone had consensus. SB 13, at its core was trying to close the communication gap between agencies when there's an internal investigation open into an officer and the officer leaves that agency. There are multiple ways that we could have tried to close that communication gap. But one thing we heard from our police officers when we surveyed them, as well as from the general public, was the concern of the so-called bad penny who would bounce from agency to agency and stay one step ahead of the officer misconduct process. And we heard frustrations from police chiefs and FO, Fraternal Order of Police and others uh, feeling like this was a process that needed to be improved and would result in enhanced trust from the community in police because it would make it easier for us to, to self-police bad behavior and misconduct. So that was the background that led to SB 13 and by extension SB 196 and House Bill 62. So SB 13 says that if an officer terminates during an open internal investigation, and that investigation also is within posts scope of authority, then the agency uh, needs to notify post uh, when that that officer is terminated and that there's still that open investigation. If that officer, um, and then the, the agency has notified post and, and post can either complete the investigation or the agency has the option to complete, or the, the agency has to complete the investigation in the 211 um, uh, violations. But if it's a, any other sort of violation, the agency does not have to complete it, but instead shall share that information with the next agency that is looking at hiring that officer. So let me explain this in layman's terms. So let's say uh, Officer John Park is employed in Cameron City. Yep, 
a little officer part. Uh, he's in he's in Cameron City, and Cameron City has opened an internal investigation uh, into alleged misconduct by Officer Park. Officer Park leaves while that investigation is still open and interviews at Spadafore City. Now, why anyone would go to Spadafore City is beyond me, but that's a different conversation for a different day. So as they interview at Spadafore City, SB 13 now requires Spadafore City to request information from Cameron City, and it requires Cameron City to share information about that internal investigation with Spadafore City. So even if there was an internal affairs investigation independent of post, and Cameron City does not complete the investigation, we're still sharing that information so that Spadafore City knows that file was open before they decide to hire Officer Park. It's still up to Spadafore City if they choose to hire Officer Park, but at least now they have all that information in front of them. Whereas prior to SB 13, there was essentially a, a wall of, of silence where it was almost legally impossible to share that information because of concern around liability. That's where SB 196 comes in, is SB 196 provides some additional protections for Cameron City to share that information as long as we're not being negligent and sharing that information as part of that state communication process so that Cameron City does not open itself up to potential liability for sharing the information uh, uh, with, with Spadafore City as part of that hiring process. I'm pausing to see if there will be any questions. I don't see any yet. But again, SB 13, SB 196 are companion bills. There's a third piece to this puzzle that we'll talk about at the end of the presentation, which is uh, what happens under grandma if you have a public records request for a, an internal investigation that is unsustained. Uh, that issue is is currently uh, going before the state records committee later this month and could result in legislation next year. But we'll go into more detail about that one in a second. But SB 13, SB 196, um, two really important bills for enhancing community trust. House Bill 62 is in the same space. Um, House Bill 62 also started in a place that caused a lot of concern within local government and within the law enforcement community because it was initially contemplated expanding the authority of post to investigate more than what they currently investigate under the law. Uh, where we ultimately ended up on House Bill 62 is if the peace officer engages in conduct that involves dishonesty or deception or knowingly engages in biased or prejudicial conduct, um, at that point, uh, post can step in and issue a letter of caution to suspend or revoke a certification. Uh, so it does expand the authority of post around uh, conduct that's been uh, proven on dishonesty or deception or knowingly engaged in biased or prejudicial conduct. So it expands post's authority in those narrow areas. Um, and at that point, post can take action. I'll pause there to see if there are any questions on House Bill 62. Cam, and let I'll me just that add. We'll have our, our wrap up, uh, our wrap ups coming in the next few days that will have more details. So, Dave, chime in. Cam, yeah, just just to add to to what to your explanation on those three bills, uh, you know, for all the folks who are who are listening, uh, all of the all of the major law enforcement organizations of the of the line officers all supported those three bills. So, uh, it, there was it was a it was a it was an effort from the league. Uh, from and from the, the chiefs, but also the line officers, they all they all supported uh, uh, the changes made in House Bill 62 and Senate Bills 13 and 196. I'm glad you, you I'm glad you brought that up because as you as city leaders think about how to communicate with the public about what happened this session, I think that's a really important point that this was a, this was a joint effort of local government officers and chiefs to say, how do we improve the integrity and the perception of the integrity of our profession and improve the, the misconduct process and the communication between agencies? So I'm, I'm, thank you, Dave, for bringing that up. Uh, and to that point, Chief Wallentine on behalf of the Chiefs of Police Association and Mayor Caldwell on behalf of the League of Cities and Towns have authored a joint op-ed highlighting a lot of these bills uh, that we are submitting this week to the Desert News that will hopefully be 
be published again to show the public uh, the positive steps that we collectively took this past session. Carson, you can go to the next slide. And Spadafores, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Cam. Uh, I'll take the first one, and, and, and Ashley and I will uh, we'll, we'll tag team these. House Bill 220, pretrial detention amendments, uh, was an interesting political fight. Uh, a year ago, in the 2020 session, uh, the legislature passed uh, House Bill 206, which dealt with pretrial detention amendments, which essentially uh, uh, tried to uh, make significant changes to what happens to individuals who are arrested, incarcerated, and can or cannot financially make bail. The, the decision was made a year ago, uh, pre-COVID, that uh, a, an individual's function an, inability, an individual's ability to make bail should not be the make or break issue as to whether someone ought to stay incarcerated or not. The issue is, uh, issue should be whether the individual is a threat to the community, uh, what the, the, past, the previous history of the individual. And, and, and so, uh, and, and, then, and, and use that criteria as being the key to determine pretrial detention or pretrial bail. So uh, it, it, just because someone has the financial means doesn't mean they should get out. If someone doesn't have the financial means, that means they stay in, in, in incarcerated. So 206 made those changes. The court administrator's office made changes with the judges. And that bill took, a house, house Bill 206 of the 2020 session took effect on October 1st, 2021. 2020, excuse me. So anyway, during, once COVID hit, there was a, a, a different situation that occurred between the courts, uh, the, courts the judges, and, and, and jails. And, and, and believe you me, you know, the, the, the role of city PDs uh, is in enforcement, investigations, that we don't run the jails, the, sh the county sheriffs do. But there was a lot of issues that were raised during the summer as to everyone was, a number of people were concerned, primarily the sheriffs, that, that too many individuals were being released without going through any sort of bail hearing. And so that's where 220 came in. 220 came in to essentially uh, undo everything that 206 uh, did the, the prior year. And to go back to a, quite frankly, a bail situation, where it was an individual's ability to pay bail to get them out of, of, of being incarcerated as they await trial. Uh, there were three bills that were initiated in 2021. House Bill 220, which passed. House Bill 240, which was a, a tweak of 206 uh, by Representative Pitcher. And then Senate Bill 171, which was kind of a combination of the two by Senator Todd Weiler. House Bill 220 was the bill that passed with some tweaks. It essentially does roll back a lot of what happened in 206. So now what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, uh, incarcerated individuals stay in jail, stay incarcerated until they get to court, uh, and regardless of whether they have an ability to pay or not to get out on bail. So, so, so we, we, we've taken, Three fourths of a step back, and but part of 220 was not statutory. But part of 220 is an interim study that is going to that the first meeting is going to be, I believe, in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, you saw Chief William uh, open up our session, welcoming everybody from the chiefs. From the chiefs, Chief William and I will be part of that pre-trial detention uh, group, working on whether and on how we're going to continue to work on bail reform. Complicated issue. Your city prosecutors are the one this impacts primarily uh, in, uh, other than those who are being detained. But this is an issue that, that you, you ought to get with your prosecutors and get with your chiefs. 
Ashley, I'll turn it over to you for the for the next couple of bills. Yeah, very quickly. So HB 237, Gen Daily Pro, this is lethal force amendments. This is again one that went through a, a number of, of reiterations. And where it started was very different from where it ended. Uh, where it started was um, in, in deadly force situations, the change they wanted to change, or the representative wanted to change the definition of look at reasonable and necessary. And while that may, may sound very, very simple, it's actually very complex and very complicated. So we had a number of attorneys, a number of, of police chiefs, uh, because by changing those simple definitions, it could greatly change how officers act in a split second situation. Um, and, and what ultimately happened is there was, I would say three, four uh, um, iterations that never actually saw the light of day. But in the end, the only change that this bill makes is a, an officer cannot use deadly force if the only individual that could be harmed in a situation is the individual with the, with a gun or, or that, that, that it's in concern. So um, if they are only a, a danger to themselves, an officer cannot uh, use deadly force. So there might be some slight modifications to how some of our training uh, um, goes forward with in the in these situations, but um, we did the bill did pass and we were supportive of this of this bill in the end. The next one I'm going to talk about is HB 248, uh, health, Mental Health Support Program for First Responders, Representative Karen Kwan. So this bill initially is what the whole goal of this bill is to provide more funds and resources for our first responders. And uh, initially the, the ask was going to be for uh, half a million dollars, 500,000 ongoing every year to support all departments and agencies uh, for additional mental health services. Uh, in the end, it was only one time, you know, Dave, Dave did a really great job and the, and the chiefs did a great job of explaining that we got questions, why should the state put forward money to help locals uh, with mental health? And, and, and the answer simply is, is all of our, all of our departments and agencies do have access, but the resources are very limited. And, and so what the, the idea of this is how can we expand um, services statewide? There's more services on, this, on, on the Wasatch front uh, can we help to expand it to the Wasatch Front, but also beyond the Wasatch Front? One of the things that we did um, on behalf of the state fire chiefs is we prepared, prepared, prepared uh, a one page, uh, one page around maybe some of the ways that we could use these, these funds in a one term capacity to show how great they are and how we can expand it. Because the goal is to get it for ongoing. So whether it's expanding survey and assessment tools for our first responders, um, behavioral health apps, expanding training, um, from additional resiliency training, things like that. But the, the, the crux of the bill is through the department or the division of human services, agencies, any agency can apply for grants for expanded mental health services for any first responder. Ashley, that's a, that's a, a great explanation of, uh, of both those bills, particularly 248. Uh, I'll just add on that. The, the way we answered the legislators as to why they should fund it quite simply is uh, when, when, when individuals need some uh, behavioral health assistance, uh, the, the city continues to pay their salary. Uh, and, and, and we have insurance. Sometimes the insurance is better, some, some insurance is better than others. And we just need to make sure that we have the proper financial uh, uh, remuneration to make sure that our first responders are well taken care of. So let's make sure we spend that money, that money well and appropriately for the benefit of our first responders. And we want to try to get, get money, uh, get that program expanded annually. Senate Bill 47 is, uh, is something that, is, is, that could be very, very important for us long going. Ongoing. Ashley talked about some training issues uh, in, I think, the slide before. Uh, uh, CIT, Crisis Intervention Training, is something that all of our officers uh, under, uh, can undertake. And now I think you'll see more of them be trained. There are two organizations that provide uh, 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 crisis intervention training. CIT Utah, which most of your agencies uh, receive their training from, and then CIT Metro, you know, which is uh, primarily West Valley, Salt Lake City, UPD, and uh, Utah County. And so, uh, over the last four or five years, the state has had a, a program where they have uh, 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 contracted out with CIT Utah to provide this training for everyone. What 47 does is it creates a two-year committee consisting of those with, with behavioral health experience, 
those who lived behavioral health issues and law enforcement to put together a best practices uh, of training and, 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 how to put to, and, and, and how to provide that for, our, for our, our communities. So over the next year or so, this 12 member committee will put together best practices. And then, uh, this, then, and then with everybody hopefully on the same sheet of music, we will ask the state for more annual funding uh, rather than just $150,000 for training because we believe more of our agencies, um, uh, those that in your cities and towns are gonna ask for more training to, uh, for your officers to receive on crisis intervention. Uh, so that's a very, very positive uh, approach. The second bill that I'm gonna do now is one that, uh, that Ashley and I uh, actually quite frankly hate, and it's asset forfeiture amendments. Uh, I started, uh, I was retained by the police chiefs back in 2004 for the first year uh, to essentially make some changes into initiative B on asset forfeiture. There was a citizens initiative back in 2002. And, 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 2000, and Senate Bill 98 uh, turns out to be the annual asset forfeiture amendments uh, bill that, that law enforcement and, uh, and the, the, the very conservative or very liberal organizations, Libertas or ACLU, work on to try and limit what, uh, what, what assets can be seized uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of products of ill-gotten gains. And uh, what we've done with Senate Bill 98 is this is a two-year effort that Senator, that Senator Weiler, Representative Lee Perry worked with law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, and, and also the private sector to come up with what we think is a balanced approach on when private assets can be seized if they are a product of, of, illegal, of, of illegal gains. One of the focuses was uh, at, the, at, at the small dollar amount, <coughs> excuse me, that, that our officers deal with, but also the bigger ticket items that are, that are, that are, uh, that are forfeited on, uh, on our interstates where the UPD is primarily involved in, uh, as we work with our uh, a number of, uh, uh, of, of of federal task forces dealing with drugs and other situations. 98 is a good bill. Hopefully we won't have to deal with asset forfeiture for a while. But your prosecutors and your chiefs ought to get involved and, and understand this because one of the issues that is in the spill is, is if your agency wants to participate with the state uh, uh, equity uh, distribution on what assets are seized, you have to have somebody who's experienced and trained in asset forfeiture. Um, so I'll jump over to <clears throat> SB 106. Uh, this is Dan Thatcher's use of force amendments. And again, this was one that was, there were a handful of use of force bills. And this is the one that kind of uh, consolidated in what we were left with. And Senator Dan Thatcher worked on, on this with the NAACP. It's quite simple um, and, and really is what it does is it creates or the post is going to create minimum standards for use of force policies because all, all departments have different use of force policies. And it's, um, you know, so it's, it's not going to mandate what your use of force policy has to be, but it will set minimum standards for what has to be included. Uh, the one thing, and maybe Davey can answer this, there's no timeline on this. So I'm, I don't know when the, post will be required to complete this overview and create the standards and when the cities will have to adopt their policies. So I think that's one thing that we're going to have to follow up on, on, on timing yeah. of this. Well, uh, there's no, there's no requirement to adopt, to adopt use of force standards. It, this just provides you minimum standards that your yeah. agency, agency can utilize if you so desire. Well, okay. Uh, moving on to the last bill on our list, Senate Bill 155. Uh, Congress, uh, 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 a year or so ago, passed the three-digit 988 mental health crisis line, similar to 911. And Senate Bill 155 adds to it the behavioral, behavioral uh, crisis uh, task commission that Utah has to include, uh, to include uh, uh, Local, local participants, uh, a representative from the league, a representative from 911, fire chiefs, police chiefs, to provide how that 988 crisis assistance is going to work. And so uh, the first meeting was yesterday. Um, uh, the first meeting was yesterday, 
And, and uh, over the next uh, six or eight months, what we will see is the Behavioral Health Crisis Committee come together to determine how the 988 mental health crisis line will work and how it will work in conjunction with 911. So that, that's prospective and we'll see what happens by the end of this calendar year. I did misspeak. Uh, uh, on May 6th, when bills take effect, uh, Post will begin working on their minimum use standards, uh, minimum use of force standards. And so you know, when that happens, uh, each agency should take a look at what Post uh, has put together to make sure your agency's uh, use of force uh, standards are at least equivalent to what Post has certified as the minimum standards. Thank you, Ashley. I'd like to also add uh, on 155, that was another one of those bills that started out in a very bad place. And they were, and, and, and the idea was to create kind of a 988 crisis line in a vacuum and not really coordinate with our 911 system. And uh, where it moved and where it ended up, I think is something that we all can work with and will probably pay really good dividends in the end, so. John, I'll tell you. Uh, yesterday, I sat through the first meeting of that Behavioral Health Crisis Commission yesterday, and it's an hour that I'll never get back in my life. <laughs> well, I'm glad, glad you're the one, Dave. <laughs> well, thank you to Dave and Ashley and Chief William for joining us today to recap what happened last year. We want to take a quick moment to talk about what is on the horizon. Uh, John Park on several occasions has has referenced where bills started versus where they ended up. And this slide identifies where we're starting on some really critical issues in, during the 2022 interim. So I mentioned during the officer misconduct portion of the presentation, this ongoing issue around unsustained findings and internal investigations. Uh, on April 29th, the State Records Committee will be uh, hearing a hearing an appeal uh, from actually multiple cities where media members and and uh, quote unquote good government groups from both within the state and outside the state of Utah have sought these unsustained findings and internal investigations into police officers and have wanted the cities to uh, disclose those and so those and the uh, applicants have said these are public records. We have said we we don't think these should be public. Uh, we should respect the due process and the privacy of our officers uh, who were investigated and had findings that were ultimately unsustained. There's not a public interest in having unsustained findings with that type of specificity out in the public sphere. April 29th will be a big day. Uh, the State Records Committee has consolidated these appeals that are coming from multiple jurisdictions and then we will strategize what to do after the State Records Committee makes their decision. Likewise, this off-season, uh, we are anticipating deliberation around body-worn camera policies. For those of you who've been around a while, you remember that back in 2016, the League and the Chiefs of Police collaboratively worked with the legislature to set some minimum standards around body-worn cameras, but still preserved your local autonomy as agencies to determine if you were going to adopt body-worn cameras and, and how many body-worn cameras. What we've seen in other states is a shift toward a mandate that every agency has to have body-worn cameras for all of their line officers. There's also a grandma issue with, uh, with body-worn camera policies, everything from the timing to the data storage and, and retention and other things. Uh, so we've learned a lot over the last five years, and there'll be a lot of work done on this issue in the upcoming interim. You heard uh, both the Spada Force talk about use of force and that there was considerable dialogue this session on use of force. We expect that to continue as well as forceful entry. There'll be dialogue, uh, as always, around the retention and recruitment of officers. Uh, we learned some really interesting information from our Y2 survey, and particularly around from among Millennials, uh, John, do you want to just take a second to to talk about little? Uh, this will be a little teaser to our presentation next week. But what we learned about uh, the perception millennials have of police in Utah? Yes, uh, we we uh, under uh, Y2 Analytics, we we did a, a just a huge survey to talk about the community trust, and and we focused on a couple of major cities and 
and uh, and really all across the state of Utah uh, to try to deal with the trust in in various age groups. And there was, uh, uh, as you might expect, uh, people of color uh, there uh, versus people not of color. There were some differences in in a, in almost all all of the the issues we did survey. But one of the things that came through that surprised us probably more than anything was the the gap in trust in age groups with. Uh, with millennials uh, scoring actually lower in some cases than any other any other category on, on police trust in, in some of the uh, police trust and, and community engagement with police officers. And that's something that we're gonna have to talk about uh, during the next several months, I think. Yeah, I agree. Those are, that's the, the pool of potential future officers. And, and yeah, those, those numbers were really quite staggering. We mentioned that the clock is already ticking for the implementation of SB 159 on data collection. And so if you or your agency are interested in being part of that dialogue, you can shoot us an email or, or mention in the chat room. Last year, the dialogue started around potential mandate from civilian review boards. Again, we're seeing this in other states. Our neighboring state of Colorado, uh, Minnesota, and other places around the country have legislatures that are moving towards mandates around body-worn cameras or civilian review boards or making significant changes to qualified immunity. In fact, going back to last June, at the same time we were putting together our task force and starting dialogue here in Utah, the Colorado legislature went into special session and passed some sweeping legislation, including making significant changes to qualified immunity uh, that have had some pretty major financial consequences on local government in the state of Colorado. Uh, there are There is some interest to make changes to qualified immunity. Uh, we There were a couple of bills this past session that we opposed uh, and that ultimately didn't go anywhere, but we think that issue will continue to uh, bubble up over the next few months. So on top of all of the bills we described in the past and the potential follow-up on those bills, uh, these are the other issues that are already on the horizon for our task force. Between the chiefs of police and the league, we request your engagement. We want the input from agencies, big and small, and from individuals uh, about where we should go on these different policies. And so uh, no engagement is too small. We welcome all of your input. If you want to engage with the task force or on any of these specific policies, again, drop us a note and uh, we can add you to the queue as we're putting together different subcommittees and different plans of attack on these different bills. Uh, John, do you want to co uh, correct your email address so people can email you? Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. If you want to, if you uh, go to john at johnhpark.com, I have no idea where it'll go. My uh, email is john at johnwpark.com. If you have any comments, would like to to hear from you. I'd, I'd just like to also kind of add that uh, I, I, I I think that the legislature is generally supportive of police departments and our police officers. And, and I, I think I learned that over this session. However, I also think that what we've accomplished this time was kind of the low hanging fruit. And where we go from here is gonna be probably a little bit harder. And so it's something we need to be engaged in. Perfect. Uh, thank you, John. As a former police chief and former city manager, we're grateful to have you as as our key staffer on, on this issue. And thank you to uh, the father-daughter duo of Dave and Ashley Spadafor for your representation of the Chiefs of Police and to be here to walk through these bills. I saw that Melinda from South Jordan posted a link in the chat room about what happened recently in New York City. And, and we're seeing this type of action all over the country. So we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, Congress is also considering uh, some rather sweeping legislation that would impact uh, how we conduct public safety in Utah. And so we're watching that very closely, but there's still a lot of work to do. So we're satisfied and, and grateful for the, for the accomplishments in the 2021 session and already revving up for what promises to be a busy interim. I don't see any other questions. So with that, thank you, John. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Carson. Thanks to all of you. And we hope we'll see all of you in sunny St. George at the Mid-Year Conference next week. Thanks everyone.